good morning and good afternoon if anybody's joining us from abroad or from the East Coast. Uh, I guess you're mid-morning on the East Coast. Uh, welcome. The City of Coquitlam would like to begin this session by acknowledging with respect and gratitude today that we are hosting this event on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples and the home of the Coquitlam First Nation. We are fortunate to live and work on this beautiful land of fresh water, forest, and mountains. Welcome to the City of Coquitlam's Recreation Facility Innovation Lecture Series. This is part three of four, ICE arenas. The City of Coquitlam is planning more than a dozen major recreation and cultural facility projects in the next 10 to 15 years, and the City began the development of a new major recreation and cultural facilities roadmap just last year. It's a user-friendly document that will distill and map out the complex process of funding, designing, constructing and operating facility projects. In planning for these works, we are hosting this lecture series to capture opportunities for innovative ideas for a number of new and renewed facilities on our horizon. In particular for ideas about how to design inclusive buildings and what are emerging trends in recreation facility design? And how fortunate are we to have an exciting um, list of panelists to share their experiences and their ideas and their future thoughts for these places. My name is Tina Mack and I'm the manager of recreation and culture facility planning at the city of Coquitlam. On my team, I have Narita Iko. Narita's in the background and Conrad Boychuk, a retired architect and IAKS member and leader who will be facilitating the conversation. Our panelists for today's discussion are James McLaughlin, Acting Director of Recreation at the City of Calgary. Welcome, James. Jim Cavillage, partner at Opsis Architecture, and Vic Yonkon, partner at MJMA Architects. Uh, we also have two registered sign language interpreters with us today. To pin the ASL videos, click the three dots on the upper right corner of their video and select pin option. Uh, providing you have the latest Zoom version, you can pin the videos of both sign languages, sign language interpreters, pardon me. In addition, we have Liz Stoppelman and Alex Nelson from the consulting firm HDR, who are providing tech support for this lecture series today. Next slide, please, thank you. If you have any questions uh, for our panelists that you'd like to pose for, for the panelists or staff, you can enter it here on Slido anonymous, anonymously. You could scan the QR, QR code with your mobile device and it will link to Slido or enter slido.com in your web browser and you'll get a call up to enter that, that pin number and you'll get right into the Q&A, pardon me, not the A, the Q portion of the session. I'll give you a sec to give that a try everyone. Yeah, so feel free to enter your questions there. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but we do promise to try to get to some of the top questions and we'll, we'll be looking for themes within that. We've also posted it uh, in the chat box in this session. So have a look there. Today, we will hear from our panel of locally and internationally practicing architects, planners, and staffers to share their insights and experiences. In addition to the benefits to the city for its ongoing projects, our team recognizes that sharing these conversations as public events could benefit other municipalities and their consultants in the planning of community facilities, as well as foster industry-wide best practices and connections. I would now like to take the time to introduce our panelists one by one, and each of our panelists will be sharing uh, their thoughts and some slides of the work of their firms or their work in their professional municipal world. We're going to start with James. Welcome, James, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm James McLaughlin. I'm acting director for Calgary Recreation. And I've been asked to give a little bit of background on myself and, and what we do in Calgary. So my background is actually as a trained architect from private practice. I moved into the municipal context uh, a few years back to help guide and lead the capital investment and asset management strategy for recreation, moving up through uh, manager up to acting director about four years ago. Uh, key activities that I engage in is looking after uh, the capital planning, of course, long-term vision for service provision across the city uh, with things including like business leadership, transformational change and talent management. 
um, key things uh, looking to the future, kind of 10 to 30 to 40 to 70 years out in terms of how we get services out to Calgarians. Um, next slide, please. So just running through very quickly on the city side of things, we have quite a robust matrix service provision model within our arenas system. Um, so publicly accessible arenas, we actually have 12 that are city operated and 28 that are um, partner operated or non-city operated. Next slide, please. Within that context, there's actually 53 ice sheets that are city ice sheets. So uh, bought, paid for and provided on the public purse. And then there's 10 sheets in the city that are accessible by the public, but that aren't owned by the city. Next slide, please. Key metric in terms of how we uh, look to provide services or provide service when the city is that one sheet per roughly 19,000. So if you look within the city limits, we have about 63 ice sheets or one sheet per 19,000 people. We also look regionally, the greater area within a 20 minute drive because we know how the ice sheets are used relative to sport. And we have one sheet at about 18,000. So that seems to be a kind of homegrown metric so we use that because of the size and scale of the city as a de definition of service provision for us. And we try to target that in terms of general access for the population, as well as about a 15 to 20 minute drive access to a local community rank for everybody in the city. Um, with that, I will keep it brief since we have such a short time and thank you for your attention. Thank you, James. You have quite a number of sheets in Calgary. It's gonna, we should follow up with some interesting conversations about comparables across the country. Uh, next, I'm going to like to introduce Jim. Over to Jim for his slides. Thank you, Tina. See. I'm uh, Jim Calvlich, a uh, partner at Opsis Architecture. We're based in Portland, Oregon. And our practice is really focused on public work, uh, both at universities and municipalities throughout the Western states and projects that we focus on are really uh, performing arts centers, education facilities, athletics and recreation. Um, community centers uh, fit into that as well and uh, some ice rinks. Um, and a, really a guiding principle behind all of our work is really a sustainable design. Can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a recent project just completed just outside of Portland. Uh, it's the Hillsboro Community Center, and it's, uh, we think, one of the first uh, CLT, all CLT community centers uh, in the States. Let's go to the next slide. Um, it's an interesting building, too, and I think kind of captures some of our values in terms of indoor outdoor connections. In this case, you can approach the facility from two sides, and it, uh, this is a view from the, uh, the park uh, elevation of the building. Next, please. And then um, kind of some fun views of the interior where uh, the mass timbers are all expressed, as well as uh, an innovative uh, tilt-up concrete that's an insulated panel. So it's really kind of a kit of parts. We're very interested in the expression of structure in our buildings. Next, please. This is a project currently under construction in an arena at University of Idaho. Um, it's located in the uh, Palouse, uh, this beautiful rolling landscape which inspired the uh, roofscape of the building. Next. Here it is under construction. Um, really a fun project and really one about collaboration too. Uh, in this case with Structure Craft up in, uh, in your neck of the woods in Vancouver, uh, a real uh, integral partner uh, in developing the structure uh, and the expression of this building. Next, please. And then our work also spans to different locations. Uh, this is in Phoenix, Arizona, where we restored uh, uh, an area of the Sonoran Desert we created a really interesting blended building that uh, brings together student services, recreation, and athletics. Next, please. And then this is uh, more relevant uh, specifically to the topic today. This is the Bend Pavilion. It's an all season uh, indoor outdoor uh, facility. Next, please. Um, it's located really to be a iconic element within Bend, which is a mill town. 
Uh, so the underside or belly of this levitating roof is all wood. Next, please. Um, it has two very different sides to it. The uh, service side, uh, uh, the arrival and locker rooms on one uh, side of the building. And then the next image is of inside, next please, uh, that kind of interface between the uh, service building and then the uh, ice rink, which is a uh, uh, NHL size facility. Uh, it's predominantly for the community with open skating. Next, please. Uh, the curling's been introduced. Next. And uh, obviously, uh, there's uh, skating, there's uh, figure skating, as well as adult and uh, youth hockey. And then, it, because it's uh, uh, the climate and bend, they really are interested in taking advantage of the summer months. Uh, where people aren't as interested in uh, skating. And so it really becomes this uh, outdoor gathering space. So you can go to the next slide uh, with kind of an extended park setting, uh, all sorts of rentals and events happen there next. And then on the interior, uh, we'll lay down a sports court. So it really becomes a, a great facility for summer camps and for, for adults and a variety of recreational activities. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction, Jim. And I really appreciate the use of CLT and, and wood, large wood timbers. It really feels like those are warm and welcoming facilities. Now over to Vic. Welcome, Vic. You've got some great slides to share as well. Over to you. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, Nareed is just going to go through these quickly. This is really, I think, fundamentally about making a social place uh, bringing it inside in, in St. John in 1870 or in Montreal in 1862, really set uh, the arena as the big room in town for all sorts of public activities. In Halliburton, my favorite town, shows how important it is, has the murals of all of the, of the guys that made it to the big leagues and even uh, you know have Matt Duchesne can have a beer named after him. These things are hybrid uh, programs and a welcoming public space is really the key uh, sort of planning element. And these projects all interconnect multiple uses. I think that's really important. So here are some maybe examples. It can be a park pavilion where it sits in the middle of a community space that has a cold side for ice sports and uh, a warm side that opens up uh, to the outdoors. Uh, these projects can involve and be convertible projects, uh, changing from ice to turf uh, with central community galleries that connect it, connect to large uh, arena halls and halls with, uh, with outdoor porches. Uh, these projects can be uh, energy and sustainability leaders. In Lakeshore, this is a building that can grow where the uh, arenas are angled for solar panels holding 60,000 square feet of generation. It's got a central lobby that's transparent to the arenas and a lot of uh, north facing soft light. Um, this project, the arenas are co-programmed with a library that's critical and, and swimming pools that uh, open onto the park landscape. So co-programming and these uh, plans can sort of invert the normal strategy here in Calgary, putting uh, the spectators and the kind of in the center of the action. Um, in Great Plains, this moves to the, the, the kind of community viewing to the middle of the plan. It's got direct views of the ice from the lobby, uh, one central uh, lobby uh, with, both, uh, with both rinks visible from that, one clear public entrance, uh, to a raised uh, spectator area. Uh, and then what this can do is uh, move the, uh, the team rooms uh, to the outside. And, and this image showing the team rooms is the sort of outside buffer to the plan. Um, these uh, ACE programs can also be stacked activities uh, here in uh, London, Ontario. Uh, uh, a kind of plan that sort of elevates in three dimensions. It has an open 
community kitchen for public sort of outreach, a library with reading, terraces going upstairs. So from the ground floor, we get lobby level participation and views to the ice. And on the upper level, we get uh, views and transparency to, uh, to upper level uh, fitness rooms. These projects can, uh, they can embrace the landscape uh, in Milton, really a courtyard uh, defines the, the project plans, big windows to a garden to the outside, but at the same time, generous views to arenas and the library and the pool form the, the sort of enclosing uh, heads of uh, around the courtyard. These projects can be uh, multi-generational. Um, in Hamilton, Ontario, a winter rink is really the center of the, the urban planning, a lounge that's shared by seniors and students, and a pool and gym complete the one, two, three blue active areas around the project. And, and that is a great bit of uh, typography, but ice can also be part of the public realm. And here in Collingwood, we're looking at a project where it forms a type of public market and a town square. So it's both an ice rink and a venue for concerts and public meetings in the middle of town. Thanks, Narita. And thank you, Vic. Really love the transparency, the connectedness to indoors from indoors to out, and the sustainability features. Thanks for sharing that. Now over to Conrad. Conrad has some slides and discussion points for us before we get into our question and answer session. Over to you, Great. Conrad. Uh, thank you, Tina. This is going to be a very quick overview of a uh, of, of history of me researching leisure ice and its options. And the first leisure ice facility that I came across are non traditional was in Quinell and that happened in 1992. And while this is what was happening in Canada, and this is simply an extension of an NHL ice pad, an additional 50 feet to create a kind of a soft rink, we see in Europe uh, something totally different. If we could have the next slide. Can, this is the Aquatech in Glasgow. Uh, it's the same vintage, maybe a bit earlier, than what we saw in, uh, in Quenelle, uh, a small little ice surface surrounded by ice rams. So this is all about entertainment, whereas Quenelle is about programs and informality, Aquatect is about entertainment, as is the next project, the Dome in Doncaster, uh, which introduces large ponds of water, uh, sloped ramps, snowfall machines, uh, theatrical lighting, etc. So the Europeans, we're going down a path that was not program oriented. It was uh, experiential. It was primarily public skating and you didn't see any kind of opportunity really for figure skating or hockey or, or curling or any of those programs. In Canada, uh, our, our evolution tended to be, well, let's, let's do this uh, leisure ice. Let's extend or create another ice pad, but let's do it on the side of the, uh, the main pad versus the end as we saw in Quenelle. And this became a, a pretty consistent standard. This was broken away from in the end of uh, the 1990s with the uh, West Side Recreation Complex in Calgary, which has both the upper and lower kind of pond ice ramps and a shinny pond uh, for entry level programs. And this is probably the most significant undertaking quantitatively in this country in terms of a commitment to leisure ice. Next slide. Uh, an image of what that looks like, very thematic. Next slide. We're also seeing a different approach to the ice experience. So in Lent Park in Cologne, done about uh, 10 years ago, next slide, we see an ice path circle around or encompass a lower level arena and a lower level swimming pool. So this allows you to circulate around the building, but you do it with uh, skates on. Very significant length here. And of course, going to uh, James Projects in, in Calgary, this is a Rocky Ridge Recreation Center, next slide, which has a fairly good size uh, leisure ice uh, facility that can be used for programs as well as casual skating. We're also seeing traditional ice in different kinds of architectural settings. 
And uh, Jim's project in Bend is a really great example of this. It, uh, you've got your traditional uh, programmable ice, but you've got an enclosure that's uh, quite unique. And the same in um, Minnesota, in St. Louis Park, their uh, outdoor recreation center. So we're seeing a couple of different trends here. One of them is the, uh, the move towards non-traditional ice, one towards uh, traditional ice, but in a non-traditional enclosure. And then uh, we're starting to see, as Vic mentioned in his commentary, uh, the use of ice in an urban environment as an urban destination. And with that very quick overview, what I would like to do now is go to the questions, uh, the questions for our panelists. And I will start with the following question. Uh, what are some of the current trends and innovations in ice arena spaces and designs? And how can these facilities target both youth and active or semi-active adults and seniors. And I'm gonna add an, a tail onto that uh, specifically for James, because you started in the architectural side and then you moved to the, in a sense, governance side from a municipal perspective. And I wonder whether that translation or tr transition from one to the other caused you to reconsider some of your earlier architectural thoughts. But for this one, uh, let's start with uh, Vic. We'll go to Jim and then James, uh, you'll finish it off. Vic? There, sorry, I was okay. mute, as always on Zoom. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing uh, demographic uh, trends that, uh, that certainly are driving, uh, driving uh, sort of programming and use. Here in Toronto, I think in uh, 10 years, we're uh, predicted to be a 63% uh, visible minority city, bringing in all sorts of uh, new people, new sporting activities, new cultural perspectives. So it's broadening out what was uh, a traditional uh, recreation base. I mean, we see that uh, frequently in, in, in effect, the sort of uh, reduced numbers, perhaps, of both uh, uh, structured, uh, structured activities. So, you know, uh, baseball and hockey on regular schedules. We're seeing more co-programming with individual activities, skate parks. Uh, we're seeing a much wider uh, range of sort of uh, uh, cultural sports being brought into the mix. So I think we're, uh, we've got to adapt with, uh, with, uh, with flexibility, both in, in uh, how we program it and how we sequence ice. And as James pointed out, uh, in Portland in the summer, ice and non-ice kind of interweaving of, of, of activities for these uh, facilities because they're big expensive things to operate and we want them we want them fundamentally pushing the kind of social and wellness agenda winter winter and summer thanks uh jim yeah well thank uh thanks for the lead in there um you know i think as you said these are very expensive facilities when they're indoors and I think designing them so they're very specific to their climate, that was one of the generators in Bend. Uh, they have a very strong outdoor recreation, uh, beautiful setting. And so during the summer months, uh, people aren't as interested uh, in, in indoor uh, recreation. And that was one of the drivers actually for this project being a uh, kind of quasi outdoor pavilion. Um, and then I think, you know, related to the, uh, the types of folks that it's serving, uh, during the summer, uh, one of the, the primary users was really kind of a summer camp. Uh, it's probably almost a fifth of their revenue during the year is uh, generated during the summer through youth camps. Uh, and that means you have to design these facilities that have lots of storage and flexibility. So where do you put that sports court? you know, during the winter time. Um, and that, that's a really important consideration in terms of adaptability and change, but uh, in all the basketball hoops and other uh, accessories that really allow it to uh, work uh, well during the summer. I think the idea too of the connection beyond just the arena and into a park-like setting is really exciting. Uh, as we saw in some of the projects and also in Bend, uh, where there's uh, capability to, uh, you know, rent the facility for uh, 
you know, business and uh, office uh, gatherings, family gatherings. So I, I think that's uh, another key criteria that allow flexibility. Thanks, Jim. Okay, James, to you. And that sort of double-sided question. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, what's really interesting from this side of the table, occupying this chair, is, is we actually look at the policy side and the programming side as critically as the actual facility side. So I'll step a little bit over into the, the policy side. We have a City of Calgary Sport for Life policy. So basically what it does is it affirms a shared responsibility to provide opportunities with our partners in the community to freely enjoy and engage in sport and recreation to their abilities and interests. So that guides everything we do. And what we find very interesting is, you know, the notional idea that these are community hubs, absolutely. Uh, they were even when they weren't designed that way, people appropriated them and used them that way. It's wonderful that the design's actually catching up to the cultural use of them in that fashion. Um, we have heavy programming through the summer with our facilities. Um, the dry pad, we actually get into, uh, I'll call it the, uh, the wonderful problem of conflict between dry pad and ice pad in the summer, because we do have continued demand for ice through the summer, as well as demand for use of the dry pads for other purposes, including summer camps, lacrosse, things like that. So it's really interesting, the, 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 the full spectrum of use that we get. You know, within that context, we also have our Calgary after school program. So for instance, um, we've got free programming for kids after school at our arenas, not every arena, but in specific neighborhoods where there's enough subscription rate from the population, again, free of access. And we make sure we provide skates for folks that don't have skates and helmets for folks that don't have helmets to make sure they're exposed and have the opportunity to use them. So the programming for us is as important as the zero step entries, the fully accessible washrooms and the community hub components that go with it. And just a, a follow up on that. Um, years ago, when Westside was happening, a lot of the programming or content of the building was driven by the community groups, and the city was a partner in terms of funding the project. Um, is that still the case? And do you see innovative options out there coming from the community or different options that you might not have considered? Um, yep, absolutely. I mean, our model is fundamentally community based. So we as a municipality go out and identify gaps in service, establish where we provide, need to provide assets to fill those gaps. And then we work with the local communities and the sporting communities to figure out what the actual componentry is that goes in to meet those gaps. So, you know, like I mentioned, the Calgary after school program, that's very much community driven. We also have things like sticks and rings and pucks where it's essentially an equipment based access for people coming from the sporting communities or other community groups um, with communities that are not what you'd call traditional ice hockey groups to get access to the ice and use the ice. Um, it's an Oshini activity, but it has all the other paraphernalia for people to be able to get out and use the ice and try different things and learn how to move and be comfortable on the ice. So you know, to your point, we're, we're very integrated with our very co various community groups. We don't really do anything without engaging our communities. Okay, and before we go on to the next question, I, I'll just ask Jim or Vic, um, is there anything in what was just said that would cause you to add on any information or shall we just go to the next question? Okay, I, I don't see um, any hands up there, so I'll go to the next one. And this kind of continues with what Jim was saying. How do you engage with the community to deliver an appropriate level of programming that champions accessibility, inclusivity, diverse participation and social engagement. And to the Canadians especially, especially when there is a strong bias towards hockey and figure skating as part of that public engagement or public voice process. And um, uh, Vic, we'll start with you again on this one. Well, I think that um we've seen over the last maybe five to 10 years that the public engagement process uh, has become larger. In some ways it's become formalized, but it's become the sort of key, uh, uh, the key element that drives all sorts of things. It drives programming, as James said, it drives uh, configuration, it drives uh, budget, it drives, uh, you know, how we operate. So, uh, that I, I think that has has 
been the biggest change for us, uh, as we've sometimes discussed in our in our IAX uh, uh, talks. The the issue uh, there's not a problem getting active pre pre confirmed participants to get organized with this stuff. It's reaching a much larger group, some inactive, um, some a demographic uh, spectrum uh, uh, edges, perhaps of seniors, seniors and youth, uh, 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 and also tr sort of trying to reach, how do you specifically reach out to uh, um, indigenous groups? How do you reach out to, uh, you know, the kind of new cultural groups uh, and where do you locate them and what kind of, how do we target sort of cultural events and the areas where we can actually draw out uh, actual information because the, the kind of, in, I, don't, I don't want to use the word entitled, but groups that know we're already at the table with their requests, we're trying to get the bigger groups that form the kind of the complete social circle to to, uh, to come out. I have to say around here, nothing has worked better than COVID because it really re restricted uh, on all our city of Toronto outdoor rinks shinny totally and just made it that you had to go and, and, uh, and uh, do leisure skating. So it was right back to uh, Montreal in 1862 that it was just a social activity open to all. So I gotta say, I was loving the COVID, uh, COVID situation. Okay, so Jim, your perspective on this. Yeah, you know, um, it's really interesting in Portland, public engagement is such a, uh, a driver of any, any of these types of projects, be it a library or, you know, community center, ice rink. And it, uh, you know, we do a lot of this and, you know, what really is, uh, challenging is reaching out to the marginalized populations, the people that don't even necessarily have a computer, they aren't going to go to a public meeting. Um, you know, lower social, uh, social economic level or, you know, whether uh, the first people up in Canada or, you know, Latino uh, population here. And so how do you do that? You know, um, it's really hard. You have to invest resources to, uh, to make it happen. And oftentimes we uh, work with a public outreach facilitator and they come in different uh, shapes and colors as well because one of the more innovative approaches is to actually work with a, a group who will reach out to the local community and find out who are the people that are the, the trusted voices there or even others uh, in the community and actually pay them for their time and their opinion. Uh, often, oftentimes they're, you know, they just don't have time to get involved. So how can you value their opinion in a way that uh, they're compensated for? I thought that's a, a really creative approach. Um, and, you know, going to the places you typically wouldn't go, a laundromat <laughs> or, you know, the affordable uh, food store, not the organic foods, but, uh, you know, the places where, you know, folks who typically can't afford high quality food go. Uh, so those are, you know, in Portland and Oregon, that's, it's just a big deal to, uh, to make sure all voices are heard. A lot of this is kind of an outgrowth of critical race theory and a no number of other uh, new kind of equity and inclusion approaches that I think we're all uh, aware of now and addressing. Thank you, Jim. So, uh, James, your perspective. Well, what's interesting is we actually, so we're talking about hard build today, but from a service access perspective, we actually look at all ice. So we, we, we provide ice out of structure or outside structures. And so there's actually a lot more points of access to ice services within the city of Calgary. We try and make sure we've got, uh, and, you know, speaking to, to Vic's vo uh, COVID wins, we actually tried some new skating paths and some new parks through COVID winter to try and expand that access because there was so much demand. We actually had to have volunteers, um, how do I say it, managing the density of people on some of the outdoor rinks because they were so popular. So the access to service is much broader than just the indoor structured rinks in our world. Um, in terms of accessing the population, what we found is roughly, and these are just rough round numbers, about a third of the population gets to recreational activity elsewhere. 
So at the ski hill, on the bike tracks, on other things like that. A third are what you'd call your dedicated audience that will access municipally provided recreation opportunities. The key challenge is accessing the other third that aren't part of those first two pieces. How do you get them? And to Jim's comment, you have to go where they are. You have to figure out ways to tap into their daily activities so you can actually get their input into how you program and design things. So we do lots of work with cultural communities. We do lots of work with, I'll say, underrepresented groups, um, age-friendly groups, even just, you know, even the Center for Sexuality and things like that, where you try and access people that don't necessarily um, get their voice heard through traditional channels. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of points on this. First, and I think, I think all three of you, you commented on it, um, the, the outreaching to groups that don't normally get outreach to or, not, or are not easy to access. And it just brought back a, a memory of mine years ago when I was doing a outreach as part of a feasibility study. I actually took my display boards and my questionnaire and all of that stuff to the, uh, to the Sikh church or to the Sikh temple uh, in an effort to outreach to that community. And it was profoundly successful because they both appreciated the effort and then gave you a, a very unique perspective in terms of the feedback. Um, because of COVID, we're, we're seeing different things happen. And I'm uh, in terms of uh, access to experiences and outdoor experiences, uh, I've written down residual memory. As we get through COVID, will the experiences that were positive in terms of some of our responses, more outdoor skating, more uh, unstructured activity, will that come and affect where perhaps your thinking goes in the future? And that's a, a question specifically, I guess, to the municipalities. And I might even ask Tina, to comment on that once we get through the, the panel group. But do you think uh, what our response to COVID has in fact created a prototype for moving forward with uh, more open, more outdoor, more informal programming? Jim. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely the case. And, you know, um, from a sustainable, it relates to sustainability as well in terms of buildings that can that be naturally ventilated, that can open up. Uh, we've been uh, integrating more robust filtration systems into our buildings uh, for air quality. It's not just COVID. I mean, you know, as you've all experienced the, uh, the forest fires in the summer uh, and it ties into resiliency as well. I think a much uh, bigger focus on uh, these facilities being able to be a safe haven during a, an event as well. So those are uh, some of the thoughts that I have. Okay, and, and James, uh, uh, and then I'll go to the next question, but I did want to get your, your take on that. We're actually having those conversations live. I mean, the COVID certainly taught our staff to think differently, react differently and program differently. And it's been a, like we call them COVID wins. It's been a great outcome in terms of what it's allowed our staff to lean into and step into. What we're doing now is we're being very careful and very observant about how the public actually behaves. We don't know what's actually stuck with the general population. We don't know how the general population is going to behave into the future. You know, even just this morning, I was going through some of the early numbers. You know, our summer fitness program, which we've reinstituted outdoors, isn't getting the same subscription rate that it did previously because folks have adapted their. I'll say their activity routines and found different means of getting their activity. They're not going back to the traditional, at least not right now, right? That might change next year, might change by August. We don't know yet. So it's in its infancy right now in terms of what the long-term legacy might be. Okay. So I'm going to get to the, uh, the to, to our final question and then uh, we will hear from um, members who are watching this. How do you enhance the financial viability of these projects? And what are some of the green innovations you are seeing? And Vic, uh, we'll, we'll go to you first on this. Um, I think the, the, the financial and recovery rate uh, question as we see it is, I mean, A, sort of structured for how it supports a community because uh, I think we see in a different, uh, different areas, different parts even of one city that can be, uh, that can offer uh, social support in terms of, the, uh, of, how, we, of how we do the, uh, of how we do the programs. Um, 
maybe I'll just, uh, I'll talk about the sustainability first, just a little bit and get it done. That is such a crit. I mean, for everyone now, I mean, that is such a, a critical issue. We're all from, from our top levels of government to uh, everyone in the community there, the kind of decarbonization of this whole process is so important. The reduction of uh, greenhouse gases is so important. And these buildings are unfortunately big uh, engines of, of that. So, I mean, I think we look all the time now on how we have a higher performing building envelope if we have natural lighting, which we like because we like good atmospheres inside, how, how do we do that uh, most efficiently? You know, how do we have uh, low emissivity uh, uh, ceilings for, you know, great kind of uh, heat re uh, reflection? How do we choose the right uh, uh, refrigeration system between ammonia and CO2 as the primaries? As, uh, depending on what uh, months of operation, how can we uh, uh, best get that? And a lot of our projects, obviously, uh, and for us from our municipal level and from council directives are exploring geothermal, um, um, you know, going electric, you know, going a route of total electrification. So I think uh, these buildings are really, I think they're complex buildings. They, there can be a lot of benefits if you interlace them with something like a pool, for example, for, for using that waste heat. But I think we're, we're seeing that these can be real examples in the community of how uh, a public project can lead on a sustainability front. Uh, you know, as, as Jim mentioned too, materials so important. We haven't yet done a carbon fiber building, but, but um, you know, mass timber, uh, carbon capture, always on, you know, always in the forefront now is how can we make the most responsible, um, responsible structure. Great, thanks. And uh, to um, to Jim and to James, uh, if you could keep your comments to about two, two and a half minutes, that would be great. Uh, Jim, we'll go with you and then we'll close with James. Okay. Um, well, the example of the Bent Pavilion is, is a really interesting one in terms of sustainability and financial viability come together. And within the first three years of uh, the building being open, it was 110 to 120 percent cost recovery. So it, it was covering its cost. And that wouldn't happen, obviously, with an indoor uh, facility. Um, the other, you know, to kind of riff off of uh, what, <laughs> what Vic was saying, you know, clients now in cities are developing their own sustainability action plans. And we're finding that they're informing now how we design buildings. We're doing a project in Seattle, Redmond, Washington, and you know the goal is a carbon neutral building, uh, all electric, uh, you know, CLT construction. Um, so the, the community is uh, driving a lot of the ambitions and uh, municipalities are forming uh, mandates that uh, are, are fantastic in terms of directing the types of projects that we all wanna see. Thanks, and James. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> though related, they're, they're slightly different. So the financial viability is slightly different from the, the green sustainability profile. We've been working on electrifying our, our, our ice resurfacer fleet, for instance, tried years ago, they were unreliable. We couldn't put it mass out. Now it's at the point where we're life cycling out all of our old ice resurfacers because the technology is caught up. You know, we've gone back through and retrofitted all of our facilities for cold water flooding, reduced our energy consumption on flooding by 79%. So all these things are now getting to the point where they're viable long-term as opposed to experimental. So there's lots of advances that are possible from an energy perspective. It also gets to how you manage the building long-term, managing the humidity relative to the indoor air temperature, relative to the outdoor air temperature. You know, there's lots of things that can be done just on a, on a day-to-day -day operation. Even you know the, the 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 lowest hanging fruit is insulating your dasher boards, and protecting it from the radiant energy of your spectators makes a big big difference. We see different energy consumptions whether we have trees on the south side of a building or not when we run summer ice. So all these things factor into sustainability and should be factoring into the design decisions that are made. From an operational perspective, from a financial viability perspective, um, it's actually possible in the Canadian context at least to run a twin rink on a net zero operating profile. 
where there is no tax support required to provide services for it. So it takes effort, it takes dedication, it takes someone worrying about that. But things like that are possible from a financial perspective in the context we operate in. So, and while interrelated, you know, we do need to parse out certain decision making uh, requirements relative to the programming and service. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, at, at this point, I, I will um, ask that question of, of Tina, and she can respond when she has a moment because we have to deal with some questions here. But, Tina, that, was, that question was about has the COVID experience caused the city to start to reconsider uh, how it might uh, plan for the future in terms of indoor versus outdoor experiences? But with the end of our questions, I'll pass it to you and you can uh, ask some of the, um, the uh, uh, questions from the audience. Oh, good. Thank, thanks very much, Conrad, and thanks um, all of our panelists for the comments for this time. We've got about 15 minutes left before we have to wrap, so I don't want to speak for long about Coquitlam's response to COVID, but maybe I'll just say it's been exciting. It's been a challenge, and our staff at Coquitlam have really pivoted um, to provide those outdoor responses, not only to host um, event, not events, activities in parks and ensure safe spacing of people on our very popular trails, uh, the popularity of which has really grown. But moreover, we've been trying to capture those few covered spaces that we do have adjacent to our rec centers to, for example, provide an outdoor spin class, uh, you know, for eight or 10 people, which is all that space could hold safely space. So I think for us that creating more of those indoor outdoor connected but covered outdoor spaces is going to be the way we're going to go with our, our facilities, in addition to looking to provide additional covered spaces in our parks. Um, so that's great. Thanks for the opportunity to, to comment there. Now back to the questions and I want to incorporate um, some that we've heard from our audience um, and I want to continue on that theme of sustainability because there was a great question because we were talked a lot about how we can be more green in the development and function of our indoor facilities but especially for this, us in the Pacific Northwest, what about those outdoor covered ice sheets? The question is, you know, we, we can do it uh, with technology, have these ice sheets almost year round or at least seasonally. Um, but from a, with refrigeration plants and technology, but from a sustainability point of view, should we? Uh, I may have to host now. So I see you're, you're all nodding. Jim, you were nodding the strongest. So I'll let you respond first. Well, I think it depends on the demand of the, the users. I mean, you need to understand the energy that's gonna go into uh, operating that sheet of ice, you know, year round. Um, and how many folks are really going to use it? Does it make financial sense uh, versus uh, limiting the, uh, the amount of availability of the ice if it's, you know, six months a year, seven months versus year round. Uh, I think it depends a lot on the climate and the uh, demand of, of the, uh, the public. Great. Thank you. Um, anybody else would like to respond to that, Vic, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think we see, we see a, a, a kind of defined window of interest uh, for it, and it, it does uh, kind of align a little bit with traditional, uh, traditional ice times and obviously you know in the springtime people are thinking of golf and gardening and we see a fall off in in uh in demand so some of the ones that we've been looking at sort of target you know what that specific couple of months two or three months span might be and then look at and as, as jim was pointing out in bend like what are the other uh programming and park activities that can slide into that in in the other um, you know, eight to nine months of the year. Perfect. Um, if it's okay, James, I'll, I'll move on to the next question and give you a chance to speak first for this one, perhaps. Um, so I have some questions. We talked a fair bit about engagement and love your ideas about, you know, getting out uh, to where the people are, especially the, the grocery stores, the temples, um, and even the laun laundromats. Um, this is a bit about engagement, but it's this question is more about engaging the public on options and emerging trends in ice facilities and balancing kind of the, the demands of organized sport, which are real, with more spontaneous and less structured facilities and programs. So how do you champion, you know, and the balance of those in the project? And in particular, um, the need to grow female participation in facilities overall. So I tried to combine a question we had with uh, one from the audience there. 
Uh, um, James first, thanks. Okay, great. So, you know, functionally, we're in a bit of a different, as, as a municipality, our role is to provide access to everyone to make sure there's equity of access and opportunity for everyone in the city. We have to balance that with the, I'll call it the market demand for time. So it's great to say we wanna make sure that everybody has equal access. If they don't avail themselves of the access, we have to make sure we're not letting something sit empty or idle. So it's balancing that need to keep it in use as much as possible with giving everybody access to it and an ability to use it. And a lot of that gets to around time management. Um, you know, we, we actually look for tenant hockey teams at some of our rinks that will use the 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. ice times that aren't really in demand, right? So it's actually, in some cases, it's, uh, how do I say it? It's over providing to certain groups at certain times to round out the use patterns, right? So it can be counterintuitive in terms of how you might manage your calendar and your time schedule to get as many people in as possible. Um, we go out and we target, like I said, the community groups to try and make sure we're getting folks in that wouldn't traditionally use it. So uh, we go into certain cultural parts of the city and make sure we've got full access and full size range of skates available for people. Because, you know, the assumption is in Canada, everyone has their own ice skates. Might have been true in the 70s and not so true today. So we try and make sure we provide what's needed for people to try out and use the asset and the amenity. It, it, there's, there's no one size fits all that really results in, in, in achieving the outcome you're looking for. And even when you think you got it, the demographics change, right? So you have to be continually evaluating and, and, and reaching out to the public. We have regular engagements uh, with members of the public and members of the sporting community to make sure that we're not off track. Um, we do satisfaction surveys through the city every two years just to make sure that we're not creeping out of alignment. So it's just, it's a continual conversation that has to be had because the population will change on you. You'll have a new group of five-year-olds become a new group of seven-year-olds or 13, 15-year-olds, and you gotta try and keep current with what their expectations are. Thank you, James. Uh, Vic, you next, maybe? Do you have comments about balancing kind of the demands of ice sports with the growing trends for less structured activities and females in particular to participate? Well, I, I mean, as you said, we definitely see a kind of shift away from uh, structure to, uh, I mean, in all sorts of recreation activities to a kind of unscheduled or more a la carte uh, drop in and maybe it's a, maybe it kind of parallels kind of choice patterns in, in larger culture, but we're, we're uh, seeing that we still have to provide uh, some specific uh, sc schedule times or we're accommodating specific schedule times, but as James mentioned, there's some there's some Goldilocks times that everyone wants. And then there's long periods of time when, uh, in fact, you may be, you may be uh, uh, looking, uh, looking for folks. So, uh, uh, you know, how to, how to uh, sort of grow the use, grow the, you know, grow the brand, I think is really important. I mean, we have, uh, as I said, our demographics are changing. We've got certainly in, in all of Canada, we've got an increasing uh, indigenous uh, population that we'd really like to support uh, in a variety of ways of how they can use uh, how they can use the facilities and uh, and, uh, and and certainly with um, and and we can uh, sort of both with programming and the, the how we do the the design of the facilities to provide that flexibility and it's cultural it's change rooms it's visibility uh, there are a whole series of, of 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 kind of characteristics and factors that we can I, that we can uh, tailor into the building I think that could make it a lot easier for more uh, for more groups uh, uh, to be to be involved. Thank you. And Jim, any comments? Uh, not a lot to add. Those were great answers uh, in particular. But, you know, it's an example on the Bend Pavilion. Um, the open skate and drop in represents 50% of the attendance. So I think that probably is not untypical of a public facility, but I think there, there's uh, a real focus on non scheduled activities. And um, so that. That's a key consideration. The other one 
I love some of the images that uh, Vic was showing of the uh, kind of concourse overlook of uh, these ice rinks. And, and then one of the things that I think was really interesting is there's a community room with windows that face right out onto the rink. So it's not just an area to circulate, but it's an area to hang out. So uh, grandparents and people, you know, people who may not be skaters are hanging out there and perhaps uh, getting inclined to put on some skates after watching the activity there. So providing those kind of passive overlooks and activities uh, uh, into these facilities, I think is really important. I think uh, Conrad showed that Lent Park in Cologne, which on that upper oh, level track has a fantastic restaurant and beer garden that opens right on, uh, right onto the skating track. So talk about, you know, just kind of a fantastic social atmosphere. And that really, really, I think assists that. Yeah. That's great. Great responses, uh, gentlemen. We'll have time for one more question, but I just want to share an observation we've had in Coquitlam is as we've been delving into the future for, of ice for our city, as we started to look at the numbers and, and while ice sport is good and it's growing actually for our female population with ringette and, and hockey and, and figure skating, we have just around 1,000, 1,500 registrants in those organized sports. And that's been fairly consistent over, over the last seven, eight years. But what we did look at is that in a single year alone, 20,000 people came out for kind of our drop in and learn to skate programs. Like, wow, what a contrast. And we have traditional ice arenas that we use, use for leisure ice purposes. So what does that mean for our future? This is a great conversation. And it's certainly pointing to looking to those inclusive, more social type spaces for ice. All right, folks, last question. Um, are there innovative ideas that have not yet been incorporated into new facilities? Maybe ideas you as architects have had in your minds and have been eager, eager, eager to realize. Are there missed opportunities? Who would like to answer that question first? Let's go back to Vic and then work our way around. I, it was interesting to see uh, Conrad's uh, blasts from the past, which were <laughs> that kind of roller rink uh, aesthetic, the, uh, the I, I think as he properly put it, more kind of entertainment uh, entertainment than sport, but still, uh, you know, promoting in, in a sly way, the kind of wellness and, and of course, the sort of social, uh, social uh, aspect of it. So I think just sort of going back to, I, I think how we started talking about this is these are incredibly uh, important kind of cultural and social centers in a community. It's kind of, it, it can be really low cost. It can be the one place and in many small towns, it's like the place, it's the center of it. Uh, you know, so if you can, you know, add on some of the, the collective, the collective uh, life of, of a community around these things, I think it's, uh, I think it's really important. Thanks, Vic. I'll work across my screen as I see it, James. I think it's really, I mean, we've started doing it with the, the latest crop of buildings is really treating these amenities as the third place, right? So you've got your home, you've got work or school, most people, and then this becomes that third place, that, that, that third social construct that you revolve your daily activities around. And we've, like I've said, we've started to move into that with the latest crop of buildings. And I think what I'm looking forward to is seeing how we start to think of them as people gathering places versus sport and recreation places into the future. We've started to slip into that, but we're still doing it and on a sport thing or and on a recreation thing. I'd like to see us to think of these as really, these are the community spaces. These are the public squares. How does that manifest itself into the future with the designs? Nice. And uh, just one minute left to go. Jim, over to you. Innovation okay, opportunities. You. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the, the trend of the future is really these blended facilities. I mean, you saw some examples of it. We have some, obviously James does, but even more so if there's ways to create this civic gathering space and green space, that's not just about recreation, but a place for concerts, uh, cultural arts being uh, blended in with a library and recreation and uh, athletics. I mean, it's just, becomes the place to go and restaurants. I mean, 
uh, blending in some of that commercial activity. People's lives are so busy to, to drive to the library one, one moment and drop the kids off and then go to, the, uh, to work out at the club. I mean, being able to have all that in one location makes so much sense and brings the community together. These are, these are the types of facilities that serve the community and represent the community uh, in the greatest impact. You think of a city hall, that's, that's great. But uh, in terms of really a, a, a facility where everyone is welcome and will use it, um, these are those facilities. And I think there's an opportunity to create some synergy efficiencies of cost and operations by blending them together even more. Great, thank you, Jim. And, and thank you to all of our panelists, James, Jim, and Vic for taking the time out of your busy schedule to participate, participate in our discussion today. This concludes part three of the Recreation Facility Innovation Lecture Series. We apologize if we didn't get to your question, if you posted it in Slido. Uh, unfortunately, we are limited to time and I've run over time, apologies for that. I would also like to thank our ASL interpreters or IT support from HDR and our Coquitlam team, Narita and Conrad. Our two previous lectures have been uploaded um, if you've missed them or if your colleagues have missed them to the City of Coquitlam's YouTube channel and are also available on the lecture series registration page. Today's session will be uploaded by Friday. And please join us for the final lecture on Wednesday, June 23rd, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific time, where we will be discussing youth and senior facilities with our panelists, John Martinez, Executive Director of Parks and Recreation at the City County of Denver, Katie Barnes, COO and Principal at Barker Rinker Seacat Architecture, and Laura Christine Gere Monk, Head of Projects at Royal Deanna. So see you all next week, and thank you so much for joining us today for this exciting conversation about the future of ICE.